Father, thank you so much for your word and thank you for what you're going to do in the service. We pray, Father, that we have a revival and you prepare our hearts as we uh, head towards revival. We pray, Father, that we have a better understanding and uh, be very soul conscious uh, before you. I pray, Father, your blessing upon this service. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. So Solomon has just finished the temple of God, and it was quite, it was quite the ceremony, uh, the celebration, uh, the permanent place of worship and sacrifice to God. The day included 22,000 sacrificed oxen, 120,000 sac uh, um, sacrificed sheep, burnt offerings. This was a, a picture of the entire full unconditional surrender, peace offering, pictures man's peace with God. Then it was a fat offering. I could be offered for that. And offered to give God all our everything. And the meat offering was a special offering for sin, made up with flour, frankincense, oil, and of course there was no meat, even though it was called a meat offering. But in Second Chronicles chapter 7, and 14, the Bible gives us the, the remedy for if something happens in the land, if something happens to the people. God says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Thank you, may be seated. So we see the remedy, if my people. And the warning was given to the Lord in verse 13 that those who are, are all pictures of God's judgment, he says, if I shove heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to vow land, or if I send pestilence among the people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. So he's trying to get our attention, and we do not see the Lord's judgment upon. Do we not see the Lord's judgment upon our nation? Uh, think about the hurricanes. Uh, this year, they'll be the most active: uh, floods, tornadoes, earthquakes, mudslides, drought, excessive cold, uh, wildfires, rioting on college campuses, and people are rioting over Hamas and uh, how Israel mis mistreated Hamas. You know, I have to tell you real quickly, there is these two nits that were on YouTube, and they were just complaining about Israel. And, uh, you know, the idea is when you say Israel, they're terrible people. Look, the whole world is filled with terrible people. Amen. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what nationality they are. That there's wicked people in every na nationality. That's right. And to all of a sudden you just say, oh, it's Israel. It's Israel. It's, it's a lie. It's a falsehood. And they were talking about, you know, uh, we're pro Hamas and so on. And these people are the type to go out and get a job and not have a family and so on. And I think Hamas, the women are in the kitchen and uh, they're either making food or making babies. That's what they're doing. And to, to align themselves up with such a, a, a country is so foolish. People just don't think. Open borders, freedom of speech taken from us. These all manifest and increase as our nation plunged and continues in a rebellion against God. And the worst of it uh, is the condition of God's children. And God addressed that. He didn't address, you know, uh, other things. He addresses his people. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, my people. And he said, this is a, not a, a, a direct, uh, directed at the drug industry, the lick industry, uh, the immoral industry. If they were uh, a verse directed uh, to the justice of our land who opposed God and his word, this is a portion of scripture that deals with God's people. And the, the thing is this, we need revival. And that's what I'm preaching on this morning. And our country needs Christians 
on fire for the Lord. Amen. We need a revival. Our country needs holy, godly, spirit-filled Christians. We need revival. Our country needs to be witnessed to. We need revival. And I, I think of the, the outrageous stuff that goes on in our country. And uh, do I miss America? I do. I, I wish America the, was back the old days. But uh, the, these are things that we have to battle against. We have to battle against the devil, the world, and the flesh. And this, we, this is why we need a whole armor of God to fight the good fight. There's a, a care, uh, specific enemies of revival spelled out in our text. And God tells us, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. And the first enemy of revival is pride. In Second Chronicles 7.14, shall humble themselves. And pride, it's inordinate esteem of one's superiority of talents, beauty, wealth, accomplishments, a rank, elevation of office, which manifests itself in lofty airs, uh, distant reserves, and often in contempt of others, rude treatment of others, loftiness, ostentatiousness, and that, that comes from the Webster's Dictionary. Pride was Satan's sin. Pride is within the heart of man. Every man has pride, and we have to deny ourselves. Pride is the sin of, wicked, uh, of the wicked. Pride is the chief sin of Sodom or Sodomites. Pride causes men to be personally deceived. Pride causes contention. Pride hardens the heart of man. If you're proud, you, your heart is being hardened. It's, being, it's resisting God. It's saying no to God. And uh, that's a foolish, foolish thought to have. Pride will lead one to destruction and cause one to fall. Pride says, I don't need the Lord. I can do it without God. I'm in control. Pride is found everywhere. The worst in God's New Testament church with his people is found in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Let's turn there, please. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17. And Paul is, uh, John is writing to the churches uh, of Asia Minor, and he says in, to the church at Laodicea, he says in verse 17, I'm sorry, verse 17, the Bible says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. Now, that is kind of like the churches today. They don't have needs. You know, the, the average Christian said, I don't need anything. Well, let me tell you what you do need. You need the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You need the power of God in your life. Amen. You need to have the, God's word hidden in your heart that you might not sin against God. Amen. You know, we, 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 there's so many things we're in need of. And for man to go around and say, I have need of nothing, this showed you their, their condition. And, uh, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And that was what Jesus said to them. That, that was from the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the Bible goes on and tells us, I don't need to serve God. I, I have need of nothing. I, I need to walk humbly. I have need of nothing. I, excuse me, I don't need to walk humbly. I have need of nothing. I don't need uh, to be filled with the Spirit. I don't need to be holy. I don't need to be separated from the world. I don't need uh, to, the Lord's help. I don't need to obey my father and mother. I don't need to love my wife as Christ loved the church. I think, I think there's some of these statements like obedience from children. You know, I, I'm amazed at the disobedience and the Bible says prophetically that these conditions are going to be found with children. And I, I speak of children, if, if they're living in your home, they're children. And uh, the, the thought is this, is I don't have to obey my parents. You know, that taught, sort of a pride is so arrogant and, and uh, you know, thoughtless towards your, your parents. I mean, it really is. Uh, they provide everything for you. You know, not only the housing, but uh, the food and the, the bedding and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, three meals a day and uh, education 
and all these different things. And you go around saying, I don't need to obey my parents. I mean, that's wrong, beloved, dead wrong. And I say that to the children because that you're part of the revival. I don't need to raise my children or children as the Bible teaches. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, verse 16, a proud look. Proverbs 8, verse 16, the fear of the Lord is pride. Hate evil and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. So the Lord hates all sin, yet there's some that move the Lord to express and then judge them. Pride, thinking more of yourself than those around you. That's an offense of God uh, to our family, to our neighbors, to our society. I don't need to prepare and pray for our church services. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 3, please. Revelation chapter 3. Again, notice verse 17. And the Bible tells us in verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. That's the average mentality of the average Christian in the average Baptist church. I have need of nothing. You know, if I have a need, I'll, I'll write a check. I'll get out my credit card. Uh, you know, I have need of nothing. And the Bible says, know not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I want to ask you a question. How would you stand before God today? Would God look at you and say, you know, oh, I agree with you, you have need of nothing? Would he, would he say that you're poor, miserable, etc.? Or he say, well done, that good and faithful servant. So these things are very important, beloved, when you consider the need for revival. Amen. And uh, the Bible says uh, the Lord hates all sin, and yet he'll judge certain sins quicker than other sins. And it's an offense of God and to our family. So this is what the enemy of revival does. It blinds us. It causes us to think we're right when we know, uh, when we know the scriptures tells us uh, differently. Uh, pray for the church services. That's why we meet at 10 o'clock to pray. And I'm, I don't know who's here, but were you here for a prayer meeting? Why not? I mean, we, we asked you, we, we cut out Sunday school so we can pray. And it's very important to pray. Amen. So these things are, you know, we put them on a back burner, oh, I got an extra hour. Not really. Pride causes us to be in such a sick and spiritual condition. Now, notice with me, if you would, Acts chapter 2, and let's compare ourselves to the first church in Acts chapter 2. And notice the Bible says in verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayers. So that's a good question. Are we doing that? Are we continuing uh, in the apostles' doctrine, the fellowship? Uh, all that believed were together and had all things common and sold the possession of goods and parted to all men as they had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat and meet with gladness and singleness of heart. So you see the condition these, these saints, uh, which they uh, had 3,000 saved on Pentecost, and uh, they were added to the 120 uh, before the day of Pentecost. The Bible says they, they were glad. They had singleness of heart. There was just one thought in their heart, and I'm going to live for Christ. I'm going to do God's will for our life. I'm going to serve God. I'm, I'm going to, you know, be everything God wants me to be. And verse 47, praising God and having faith with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So how do we uh, compare? And uh, you say, well, you know, the Bible says don't compare yourself among yourself. I understand that. I, I get that. We're not to be that way. But the idea is, how would we line up with the first church in Jerusalem? And uh, the Bible tells us that pride is hated by God. And then God's will is for his children and his churches be humble. And do you have humility in your life? You say, I pride myself on humility. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Humility is a modest estimate of one's own worth. Lowliness of mind, 
a deep sense of unworthiness in the sight of God, to bend a knee, to bring down, to submit, to place yourself on the Lordship of Christ. So humility seeks God's glory, not self. Humility uh, seeks to esteem others better than themselves. Humility is concerned about others, not self. Humility is Christ-likeness. Humility submits to God's will. Humility is mindful of the weak children, uh, of the weak, excuse me, uh, and then children, the poor, the weak-minded, those who have few talents, those who are weak in faith. So they consider them, and they, they want to help them. And humility is not self-confident, but rather God-confident. I have trust in the Lord that God's going to take care of this. I have trust in God that God's going to work these things out. Humility receives the word of God. That's important. You know, maybe the problem is when people are lost, they're not willing to receive what God's word has to say. And maybe what's the, what's the reason? They're proud. Proud. Humility is necessary for God's blessing. Humility is before grace. In other words, uh, our lives should be characterized by humility. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's necessary for growth in the Christian life. When we consider Jonah preaching to the heathen, the pagan nation of Nineveh, they humble themselves. The Bible says uh, they deny themselves. And um, they cried unto the Lord. They turned everyone from his evil ways. So one of the first enemies of revival is pride. So I have 20 of these. Just stay with me. Just kidding. Relax. The second enemy is prayerlessness. Second Chronicles 7, 14, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. The first cousin of pride is prayerlessness. Prayerlessness is satisfied with self. It relies on self instead of the Lord. It's self-sufficient on one's ability, on one's ability uh, on, the, uh, on the flesh. It's an enemy of revival. Prayer is the ultimate statement of inability. We, we, we will not have, uh, cannot have revival apart from prayer. We've got to pray. You say, well, revival's coming, well, I'm going to start praying. No. You need to pray every day. Amen. You need to pray throughout the day. Amen. One man said prayer is the essential link in the, uh, in the events that lead to revival. We don't pray or we don't, we don't pray. We should receive, I'm sorry, we should, uh, let me move on to the next quote here. I don't know what happened to that one. Uh, Lennon Ravenhill said the church is dying on its feet because it's not living on its knees. Our praying is fleshly, anemic, antiseptic, heartless, formal, faithless, not moving the hand of God. James chapter 4 verse 2 says, Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust." Ian Bounds stated our estimation of prayer is shown by how much time we give it. So you can say, I, I pray before my meals. That's fine, but that's what you should be doing. You know, let's not, you know, think of ourselves higher than we should. You know, prayerlessness is a great plight on the average Christian today. The average Christian, say, uh, they say they pray three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. How do you go before God in three minutes? One of the great sins of our day, prayerlessness. James 4, 2, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your own lusts. Ian Bounds stated our estimation prayer is shown by how much time we give it, the self-sufficiency, we do not pray, the self-satisfied will not pray, and the self-righteous cannot pray. Prayer should be in our last resort, uh, should not be our last resort, but our first. A.W. Tozer said, 
praying in the will of God is to want what the Lord wants. See, that's when you know you're praying. When you're, you're yielding yourself to the Lord's will, to what the Word of God has to say. R.A. Torrey said the chief purpose of prayer is that God may be glorified in the answer. And that's really what we want. We want to glorify God. What you, what's all you do in word or deed? Do all to the glory of God. Amen. So that should be our motivation, the glory of God. The third enemy of revival is priority. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, the Bible says, that my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. So seek speaks of seeking out any method, especially by worship and prayer. Faith speaks of countenance, to turn towards his direction. In other words, as the Bible says in Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the key. Seeking first the kingdom of God. The kingdom that God lives in, that works in, uh, and so on. And revival will not come, those seek revival, but rather seeking God. You know, the Bible said, I quoted last week, uh, when revival came, they were uh, a people saturated with God. That's the, that's the key, not saturated with revival, but rather saturated with God. Amen. Seeking God is not seeking him for what he can do, uh, for us, but rather wanting the Lord for who he is. So important. Amen. Loving the Lord for who he is. Our priority is seeking God, caring about what God cares about. Let's go to John chapter 5, please. John chapter 5, and let's look at verse 19 and 20. The Bible says in chapter 5 and verse 19, Then answered Jesus, said unto them, Very verily I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeketh the Father to do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the, the Son likewise. Verse 20, For the Father loveth the Son, and showed him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him great and greater works than these that he may marvel. And then notice he would chapter 8 and verse 29. Chapter 8 of John and verse 29. And the Bible says, He, he that sent me is with me. The Father had not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And that should be our, our motto. I want to please the Lord. I want to do those things that please God. Revival will come when we seek and hunger for the Lord, just not just what he can do for us. Some say the instance of revival is falling in love with Jesus all over again. And when the Lord is our priority in everything, let's see where, we, where we're at. Ask yourself these questions. Number one, on what activity do I spend most of my time? Number two, on um, what do you spend most of your money? Number three, on um, what do you focus your thoughts on? So where do you go? What do you spend your money? Uh, what do you invest in? Is Christ first place? Is Christ your priority? I mean, that's the question. If my people are called by my name, shall humble themselves and, and pray and seek my face. That's a priority. And are you seeking the Lord? Or what can you gain from the Lord? That's a good question. Is the Lord Jesus the main goal or is he a side issue? Is Christ a priority or is it afterthought? Is Christ an addition to your life or is he your life? No, the Lord said, seek my face. The fourth enemy of revival is presumptuous. So in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, God tells us, if my people, they're called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, 
and turn from their wicked ways. Now, presumption is, being presumptuous is, is assumption, take a lawful license of liberty. Uh, here our Lord states, turn from your wicked ways. And we're in an age of justifying our sins. There's majority on the minor and minoring on the majors. Some are pharisaical, some are hypocritical. The Lord states, turn from your wicked ways. So what are the ways in your life that would be considered wicked? Oh, I'm not telling you to tell me. But tell God. I think it's very important. Are you an honest businessman? Do you take from uh, people unjustly? Are you fair? Are you just? I mean, it is simple. This is Christianity 101. And we have to be, we have to be very fair with people. Revival has not uh, come to presumptuous people. God's people must be honest with God. Think about our nation. We're not, we're not honest with our, as a nation. We're not. Think about our government. They're not honest with us. Think about our churches. They're not honest. So many churches have a false way of getting to heaven. It's not the Bible way. It's a false way. Think about what the, what the Word of God says. Think about the stores. They say, how many ounces are in? They make the bag look bigger than what it is. You open up the bag, it's a third filled. Right? I hate that. <laughs> Our nation is not honest. Our nation is hypocritical. The claim to be more, to, is more money for education so we can legalize and promote uh, a gambling. We have an epidemic of immorality with men and women. So he addressed the problem by handing out condoms and make abortions was a nothing. We have lost our Christian conscience. It's gone. And really, when you go to a church like ours, that's where you find the Christian conscience. Otherwise, it's not in society. It's absent. And open borders, lack of lawful obedience, we have people leading our country who are against our country. Right. And, but what does the child of God doing at justifying, rationalizing, excusing our sin before a holy God? I mean, think about the absurdity of that. How can you excuse our sin presuming that God will overlook our sins and bless in spite of our wickedness. I got to a place where I can't, I can't sing God bless America. I don't think America needs to be blessed. We need revival. Amen. It starts here in the local church. Yeah. Proverbs twenty-eight thirteen: he that covers sin shall not prosper. It's amazing what accepted in Christianity in our day. And when, uh, no, let's not speak of others, but let us examine ourselves. What are our wicked ways? We've mentioned pride, prayerlessness, priorities, presumptions. What are the presumptions about? Let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 8, please. Ezekiel chapter 8. Now, you, I know you just did your devotion there this morning. And notice verse 12. And the Bible says, verse 12 of chapter 8 of Ezekiel, Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancient of the house of Israel do in the dark? every man in the chamber of his imagery. For they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said unto me, he said, also, 
said also unto me, turn thee again, uh, yet again, and thou shalt see greater abomination that they do. Now, these are people who are servants in the house of God. I mean, it's unbelievable. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat a woman weeping for Tam and Tammuz. And then said he unto, the, unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see great abomination than these. Now Tammuz was a false, a false god. He was an idol. And verse 16, he brought me again to the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about 520 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east and worship his son before the east. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is the light thing to the house of Judah? that commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And though they put a branch in their nose, therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I uh, have pity. And though they cry unto me, uh, mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Now, that was going on in the temple of God. People are committing abominations. So what are we doing? What are some of the wicked ways that we're, we're, we're involved with? I mean, I don't know. And then 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible tells us, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen? Amen. And what idols do you have in the chambers of your heart? Do you appear one way outwardly and live differently inwardly? Are you in idolatry? Do your house, uh, do your ha house your family, have you, uh, have you taken up the cross? Are you worshiping things that shouldn't be worshiped? Do you appear separated outwardly from the world, yet inwardly or behind closed doors, presume upon God by practicing worldliness? Listen to the world's music, imitating the world's fashions. Uh, do you presume against God by separating uh, from the opposite sex? Yet you make idols in your hearts. Whether it's male or female, you have fantasies of uh, being with that person. This is idolatry. This is wicked. You don't, don't you fear God? Don't you realize that God knows this? Do you think God gives our church revival with this sort of idolatry given over to in our hearts? Protation with other men and women that don't belong to us. Again, this is idolatry. It may be materialism. Some people live to gain and purchase. Materialism is a curse on society. We as Christians have been infected by such. We've gotten all sorts of debt and gain, 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 not just furnishings, but how much a materialism, uh, excessiveness, brand names only. Paul told Timothy, exercise thyself in the godliness, and godliness with contentment is great gain. So another sin that is wicked is complaining. We complain about life, situations that happen to us. Uh, it could happen uh, about ourselves, our lives, our health, our jobs, our situation, our predicaments, complaining about our needs, provision, etc. One would think was... Uh, Worse when we, when we were lost. I mean, that should be the ultimate complaint. I was so lost. I was without Christ. But see, saints of God are affected by the world. The world complains about the weather. What are we going to do? Join in. Oh, it's cold out today. 
Oh, it's rainy. Oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. It's complain, complain, complain. Can't believe the price of milk. Can't believe the price of bread. I can't, I can't believe it. Believe it. What would think that it was worse when we were lost, when we were unsaved, when we were separated from God? And our lives were in sin. No, God's people murmur and complain about too much. Everything's a problem. And something we, we murmur uh, that's so unjustified. We think it's possible. We think it's possible that the, the Lord allowed these things. <laughs> God directed your steps. The Lord put you in such a place and position to complain, to question God's goodness, his leadership, God's provision. Let's turn to Second Chronicle, uh, Second Corinthians chapter four, please. Chapter four, and we pick up here in verse eight. Notice the Bible says, We are trouble on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in our bodies the dying Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our bodies. For, what, for we which live are always delivered unto the death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So these things that Paul mentions in chapter 7, 8, and 9, it was for a reason. He said, persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. So these, uh, uh, these things are so important that we realize what God is doing when he does this in our lives. Paul was not complaining about his life, but stating that the life had many problems and troubles and difficult situations, things he did not comprehend, things that did not make sense to him. That's all right. He was living by faith in the Son of God. That, that was a key. So he may not have understood everything, but he was living by faith. I'm going to trust God. God knows exactly what he's doing. And yet... He trusted the Lord. He's, he, he had a great love for God. He rested in the Lord. He lived by faith, not by murmuring and complaining. Let's go back to our text. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. They will forgive their sins and heal their lands. There's a great story about Elijah as he goes up against uh, the prophets of Baal. And the prophets of Baal just chanted all night and crying out to Baal. There's no Baal. It's like people who say, I believe in Allah. There's no Allah. There's no Buddha. There's, there's only one God in a triune God. So they're out there cutting themselves and all sorts of things. When they're done, and by the way, Elijah was mocking them, rightfully so. False gods, false teaching. So he gets up and he starts preparing for the Lord God to answer their prayers. So he puts a sacrifice on an altar. He takes water, pours it all over it different times, and he simply prays to the Lord and asks God for fire to fall from heaven. And the Bible says at that time, then, then God heard his prayer then. And we're, we're going to do what we need to do for revival. 
then God will hear our prayers and give us Holy Spirit revival. Let's stand on our feet, please. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and no one looking around. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the message you gave us. We pray, Father, you do a great work. I pray people would spawn and do your will. I pray whatever it is that you speak their hearts about, I pray your will be done. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.